So hello again, uh, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Uh, sorry, we had a bit of a change in, in the timing uh, and uh, because of uh, Dr. Hamid is uh, talking from California. And if we had to start at five o'clock, it would be quite uh, early for him. So I just spoke to Dr. Hamid. He's already on online. Uh, let me just see. But he has not turned on. Uh, here we go. Okay. One second. One moment. Okay, Hamid, can you can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? <clears throat> Great. Thank you very much for for joining us, and good morning to you. Thank you, and good evening to you. This is the end of day for us, so I might look a bit rough and tired, but uh, <laughs> but thank you very much uh, for joining. We've always enjoyed your your talks, and we're hoping that uh, you could tell us about uh, avoiding and managing complication in chronic uh, ear surgery. Are you calling by phone, Hamid? Oh. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Let me share my screen here. Okay. I think you have to give me the ability. Okay. I, 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 for security reasons, I uh, I stopped that. You're right. Okay. Here we go. Should be able to. Yeah, looks good. Okay, can you see my screen okay? Absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. Should I start or? Please go ahead, Harry. Okay. So thank you again, um, uh, Dr. Tarabici, for inviting me. Uh, it's a great honor to be speaking to your group. I'm going to talk about prevention and management of uh, otologic surgery complications. Uh, these are my disclosures. Just so you kind of get an idea where Irvine, California is. Um, so California is obviously in the western part of the United States, as most of you know, probably. And Irvine is in the southern part of California. It's uh, very close to Los Angeles. And it's where Disneyland is. So uh, if you have children, then, then you'll know where it is. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, complications that can arise from mastoid parts of the surgery and then middle ear instrumentation. And we'll try to go through all of these. Now, in general, at least in the United States, um, there's a lot of uh, problems with patients uh, pursuing lawsuits against physicians. So here we have to have a, a pretty detailed consent form, meaning the patient kind of gives us approval for the surgery and that they understood that these risks exist. So it's very important, at least if, if you're in a country where this is an issue, that you have such a list that you give to your patients that they sign. Um, there's kind of a standard form that comes that says they, they give permission to do the surgery, but, but really that, that's a very generic form that just says that, you know, they're gonna have surgery and it's gonna be on one this year, et cetera. But what I have is a list of everything that says you can get an infection, you can get failure, you can get facial paralysis. And, and we have the associated risks of those and what kinds of things are done to kind of reduce those risks, but just so that they're aware that these things can happen. That way, there's no question of whether afterwards, if something happens, the patient doesn't come back and say, well, I didn't know I could get a change in my taste or otherwise I wouldn't have done surgery. And that's when it's listed and the patient says, I understood and they sign it, then there's no question that they actually did understand it beforehand. Because that, that's a pretty significant problem in the United States. And um, but may, may not be the issue everywhere else. And we kind of have to write a little note saying that we talked about the common and uncommon things and 
you know, what sort of our statistics, you know, your own statistics are for, for these things. Now, probably, I think of all the things that can go wrong in a mastoid surgery, a horizontal canal injury is probably the worst thing because it's really the only thing that we can't easily reverse. Um, pretty much everything else is fixable, um, at least to a certain extent, but horizontal canal injury is, is not one of those. Now, a horizontal canal is going to be most susceptible in a very contracted mastoid, so a very small mastoid. So here's an example of a horizontal canal that's going to be in danger. This is, this is one patient on the left. So if you're trying to do a canal wall up mastoidectomy in this patient, which I would not advise doing a canal wall up mastoidectomy, but let's say you are going to do it, you have to go through probably about almost two centimeters of solid bone to aim for about maybe a five or six millimeter space. And to be able to get that exactly correct is, is difficult because as you can see, the horizontal canal is continuous with that bone. And so if you're just off by a few millimeters in your angle, a um, few degrees in your angle, you're going to come through the horizontal rather than go into that small space. So in a patient like this, you you don't want to be doing a canal wall up mastoidectomy. This is one where you're doing an inside out or an extended adicotomy in order to clean out this area. What I've personally found is when, when patients have such small mastoids and they have a perforation and I intend to do a uh, mastoid clean out, all that's really needed is I just do a little bit of curetting of the sputum and just irrigate um, up here with a little bit of betadine and a little bit of saline. Um, and I haven't had issues with failure because of not drilling that area out entirely. Um, this is another example. Here you can see that the Kerner septum is only about a millimeter away from your horizontal canal. So this patient, if you're coming in from this direction, um, one of the problems that can occur is, is you could end up in this space here thinking that this space is that space. And then you can try to drill anteriorly to try to find your incus, for example. And then you're going to go through the horizontal canal. Or you just come through, you don't realize you've gone through the coronary septum and then end up in the horizontal canal. So be very afraid of a very small mastoid like this and avoid doing a canal wall up mastoidectomy. This is the time where you do a, an inside out. You go in through the ear canal and drill backwards. In general, in the mastoid, you always want to stay high and anterior. So I always tell my residents, if you are drilling in the mastoid and you can't figure out where you are, zoom out, look to see where you are. If you're right behind the ear canal, that is the danger zone. That is not where you should be. You're, you should be aiming to be about, if, if this is the right ear and this is 12 o'clock here, 6 o'clock here, you should be aiming to be somewhere between 10.30 and 11.00 because that's the area of the antral air cell. If you're straight behind the ear canal, that's where you're gonna get into the facial nerve and the horizontal canal, et cetera. In general, when people who are younger surgeons, um, they try to avoid the tegmen because they're afraid of getting an injury in the tegmen. And that's definitely understandable and that that's some, something that definitely has you know, happened. And we'll talk about that. Uh, but. The tegmin is your friend. So if you can follow the tegmin in, you'll stay always in and you'll always end up in the antral air cell. The, the trick is a lot of times people find the tegmin way outside here and then they can become very afraid and they, they leave a lot of bone on the tegmin to try to avoid the tegmin. And then, so then they, they're drilling with this part of the mastoid covered. So they're drilling right behind the ear canal. So you always have to look back, where is your ear canal? a posterior superior. So if you're doing a cochlear implant, for example, where you're not doing any canal dissection, you should still define your canal. You should still separate the skin a little bit from the bony canal. So you know exactly where the top of the canal is, exactly where the posterior part of the canal is, so that you know that where you're going to be ending up, so which is up here. Um, after you, you enter through the Kerner septum, you want to use a smaller burr because a big burr in that space is bound to create problems. Either you're gonna get through the ear canal or the tegmin or potentially get the back side of the drill can hit the horizontal canal. So 
stay stay away from using big burrs once you've gone through the Kerner septum. I personally, when when I drill, um, I work with residents, so I you know when we drill through and we get through the Kerner septum a little bit, I just have them use the curette to just open the the Kerner septum completely, so then you can get full visualization of the horizontal canal, and then you know exactly where you are, and then you can use a, a smaller burr like a three or a four millimeter burr. Now, as I mentioned, horizontal canal is posterior and superior to the external auditory canal. So um, if you are directly posterior to the ear canal, you're, you're going to be in danger. Now, the other thing is that a horizontal canal is approximately two centimeters from the lateral cortex. So if you're lost in the, ear can, in the mastoid and you're not sure where you are, you just put your suction into the, the mastoid um, and kind of put your finger at the edge of the mastoid cortex and then bring it out and measure it. If you are two centimeters in, then you're gonna be in the area of the horizontal canal. If you're less than 1.5 centimeters, and this is in adults, of course in children, it's a little shallower. But if, you're, if it's 1.5 centimeters, you probably are not through the Kerner septum yet. Um, if the horizontal canal you find out is opened, you, of course, don't suction it. You want to quickly cover it with bone wax or fascia or something and uh, give the patient intravenous steroids, uh, put some round window steroids, and, and pray that the patient's hearing is, is preserved. This is actually a CT scan of a patient who had had surgery somewhere else, and they drilled through the horizontal canal. And this is the preoperative CT. You can see it was a very small mastoid very, very thick um, cortex. And the surgeon actually did a pretty decent job um, following the tegmin. The problem was once they got to the Kerner septum and they went through it, they were in the soft tissue of the mastoid, the, probably the mucosa. They continued drilling. And you never drill through um, inflamed mucosa because you lose your, your ability to sense what the tissue is that you're drilling through. You can't tell what you're drilling through. And the, one of the problems is sometimes if people are accidentally have gone in through the brain and if you keep drilling through soft tissue, you're drilling further into the brain causing a lot of damage. So you, if you get to soft tissue, use a curette. Remove the soft tissue so you can see the bony edges and see what you're looking at before you continue drilling. So this is a very... Uh, actually, the surgeon did a decent job, but unfortunately, probably continued drilling through the horizontal canal uh, once they got through the mucosa. So the mastoid facial nerve injury is generally going to occur um, in two potential areas. One is it occurs here as the facial nerve starts coming and becoming more superficial. The other place where it is, is occurs here as part of a what I call a double whammy, which is a horizontal canal and facial nerve injury at the same time. So as you know, that the facial nerve uh, generally, it, you know, it's going to be below your horizontal canal and it's sort of at a depth of around the annulus, approximately a couple millimeters lateral or medial to the annulus. And then it rises and comes more superficially as it gets to the stylomastoid foramen. So staying lateral to the incus will save you your facial nerve in this area. It will not save you in this area, of course. So generally speaking, if you're lateral to the incus, you know, you should not get into the facial nerve, but that's, that, that's in the middle ear and the in, initial uh, genio, the mastoid, the second genio. Um, in, in children, you have to be very careful because this, this comes up quickly because the mastoid is much shorter. So the mastoid wouldn't be this big, the mastoid would be this big. And so the facial nerve has a much more acute course coming out towards the outside. And then the facial nerve is also at risk when you're making your incisions. So initially when you're making your incision and using the, the cautery to, to cut through their, your periosteum, then as you come in on the mastoid cortex, you have to always stay on the lateral aspect of the cortex when you're um, using your electrocautery. So I always tell my residents, put your finger on the mastoid tip so as we're doing anything, I put uh, in the back of the ear, whether it's injection or in initial incision or the cautery, 
always finger in the back, right in front of the mastoid, where the facial nerve exits. So I tell my residents that it, you should not get close to your finger because you're either going to cut your finger or you're going to inject your finger. And that means then you're injecting your facial nerve. So stay away from that because if you inject lidocaine, as, as you probably know, uh, you definitely know, uh, lidocaine around the facial nerve uh, exit, you're going to then lose your ability to have facial uh, monitoring during the surgery. Um, so we talked about the uh, skin and soft tissue incisions. So finger anterior to the tip. Uh, in a contracted mastoid, again, you have to be very careful. Um, the, the sort of inferior aspect, as I said, is going to be at risk for in a contracted mastoid. So um, I generally get a CT scan on uh, almost all patients undergoing surgery. And the main reason I do that is because I don't like surprises in surgery. I like to know where everything is so that I know what I'm getting into. I always cite the example of you never see a sinus surgeon doing a, C, doing a sinus surgery without a CT scan. And what's the difference between sinus surgery and ear surgery? So you have a very important nerve-like structure, like the optic nerve and, and the eye. And here you have the ear and the facial nerve. And you have brain and sinus surgery, and you have brain and ear surgery. Why do we not get CT scans um, in ear surgery? And we do get them for sinus surgery. I, I, don't, I don't know the logic, but I get them because I, I don't see the logic of why we shouldn't. Um, so the kinds of things you want to look for, look at sort of the depth of the facial nerve. So here's your facial nerve and look at the depth of it in the mastoid. Look for um, how much solid bone there is. Sometimes there, there are air cells surrounding the facial nerve entirely so that it's usually the, the structures that are important in, in mastoid are when the air cells have ended. But in the facial nerve, you can have um, air cells kind of come all the way up and around the, the facial nerves, which make it difficult sometimes to identify as you're going through. Um, in the mastoid tip area, there should be this, these air cells that are, that are behind the facial nerve, um, which would be in this area, this retrofacial air cell tract. So you have to be aware as you're drilling inferiorly, you want to stay a little bit more posteriorly uh, in the mastoid and not hug the ear canal. If you're staying close to the ear canal as you're drilling inferior to the mastoid, you're going to get into trouble with the facial nerve. Uh, and of course, superiorly, we talked about staying lateral uh, to the incus short process. Um, in the mastoid, if you have a lot of granulation tissue around the horizontal canal, you want to pull on them very gently. Um, if there is granulation tissue extending below the horizontal canal, then that's when you have to be very careful and very slow. Um, and if I just grab a little bit of it, if it pulls a little bit, I pull it out. If it doesn't come, I leave it alone. Um, you don't have to remove all the mucosa out of the mastoid. Um, I, you know, I've been doing you know, mastoid surgery for close to 20 years and probably you know, 4,000 of these surgeries. And I can tell you that you don't have to remove all the mucosa. You remove as much as you can, but there's no way to remove all the mucosa. And then you can put things in danger by, by trying to get every little bit of mucosa. So this is just looking at the facial nerve and where it's positioned uh, relative to the annulus. So the annulus uh, and the tympanic membrane is going to be about here. In some patients, it's a little bit uh, medial. In some patients, it's a little bit lateral to the annulus. Um, and you have to look at the CT scan because if you're going to be doing a canal plasty, you have to know where that facial nerve is going to be relative to your um, uh, canal. And at the level of the annulus, in the posterior inferior quadrant, that's where you're going to be closest to the nerve at about two or three millimeters away. So in posterior inferior canal plasty, that's when you can potentially get into trouble. So be careful in that area. This is a sagittal uh, scan looking at the sort of course of the facial nerve. Um, this is your horizontal canal and the ossicles, of course. But um, it looks like that this is the area that, it, that where it's closest, but it's actually three-dimensionally, this area ends up in the middle ear. So it, it actually is going to be this area that's going to be the closest when you're doing a canal plastic. 
Um, and this is just looking at the, the course of the mastoid. And you can see the shape of the mastoid the way it is. This is a contracted mastoid here. And you can see here, we have about 14 millimeters from the lateral cortex. You know, horizontal canal, as I said, is about 20 millimeters from the lateral cortex. Uh, here, here we have about 14, but at the, as we're getting close to this thylomastoid foramen, it's only about 11 millimeters. And that three millimeters is one width of your three millimeter burrs. You have to be careful. Now, if you're using a cutting burr and you're getting close to the facial nerve, um, I would recommend putting the drill on reverse so that the drill doesn't cut with the cut surf, the, the sharp surface, it cuts with the blunt surface. It acts more like a, um, a diamond burr. And so it's less likely to take a, a, a big piece out of the nerve. It's more likely to just bruise the nerve if you were to hit the nerve potentially. And it's, it's a good practice to follow your facial nerve um, in, on your CT scan to just kind of get an idea where the facial nerve is located um, in, in each patient. Keep in mind that the, if you're kind of not sure in the mastoid where the nerve is, if you look at the basal turn of the cochlea, you have this space, which is the, the sinus tympani, and on the other side of it is where the facial nerve is going to be. So here is the basal turn of the cochlea, and here is your sinus tympani, and here it is, um, the facial nerve on the other side. And then here you can see here it is here, here it is here. You just, you just want to be able to follow it and see where it is located compared to structures of the ear canal and then structures of the mastoid. Now, in a routine mastoidectomy, um, we really shouldn't be drilling this far medially and inferiorly. Um, you, again, as I said, we don't need to remove every little bit of mucosa. You want to open up all the spaces, wash them out, but you don't need to remove every little bit of mucosa. It, it's not possible. Now, some people have said that the, the indications for getting a CT scan are revision surgery or cholesteatoma surgery. And, um, you know, I definitely wouldn't disagree with getting CT scan in those, but I think there's, uh, there's definitely, I think, a benefit to getting a CT scan in, in other cases as well. Um, this is a patient who'd had a canal wall down mastoidectomy. Um, you can see here is the, uh, the wall down. Here's your cochlea. Here's the facial nerve. This looks okay. But on the other side, here's your cochlea. Here's the facial nerve right here. And you can see that the tympanic membrane is adherent right onto the facial nerve. So if you're coming in to dissect and enter the middle ear, you're going to get to the facial nerve look, which is going to look like the annulus potentially, and you're going to try to lift it up. Um, and here it is on this side. Uh, here it is on the other side here. Again, um, the facial nerve is kind of right under uh, the, your skin and soft tissue. So be very careful of these, of course. And in a case like this, you want to enter the middle ear way superiorly so that you don't get into this area at all. Because if you're entering the middle ear, you're really trying to do an ossicular reconstruction potentially. All you got to be is way up superiorly. Now in the middle ear, the patient nerve, as you know, is dehiscent about 50% of the time um, around the oval window. So it's right above the oval window where it's most uh, likely. Now, the most likely time to get a facial uh, nerve injury in the middle ear is when you have a posterior superior quadrant cholesteatoma, where there's been a lot of destruction of the sputum and the incus is missing, so you, you lose your frame of reference. The stapes is missing, so you lose the, your frame of reference. And so the, the tympanic membrane and the cholesteatoma are basically right on the facial nerve in the oval window. And um, you can co be coming in thinking that you're very low in the middle ear, but because there's destruction of the sputum, you're actually really high in the middle ear. And then you can get into the facial nerve. There was actually uh, a patient I was operating on once, <clears throat> and it was a posterior superior quadrant cholesteatoma. And I told my um, resident, I said, the facial nerve should be right here. And, you know, of course, there's granulation tissue and it makes it very difficult to tell what anything is. Uh, and there's bleeding. And so we're looking at it and I said, I, this, this should be the facial nerve. So just as I said, just as an exercise, let's stimulate it. So I stimulated the facial nerve and we got no response. 
And I said, I'm, I'm still going to consider this the facial nerve. We're still going to operate like this is the facial nerve. And, but I was surprised why the facial nerve wasn't stimulating. So I said, let's, um, you know, let's change the probe. So we changed the probe and it didn't stimulate. We changed the, the actual uh, monitor and it still didn't stimulate. And then I said, you know, what's the only thing we haven't changed? And that was the little box that the electrodes will, will go into. And um, once we change that, then the facial nerve stimulated. And the lesson from that is really that the, you cannot rely on the facial nerve monitor as a way to save you from injuring the facial nerve. It's just like navigation in sinus surgery. It helps um, when you're in trouble potentially, but it has to work for it to actually help you. And facial nerve monitor, just like any other device, is not 100% um, working all the time. So you have to always be, be aware of that. So you want to look at your CT uh, on axial and coronal cuts. Um, here is a coronal cut of the a sort of a normal facial nerve. So you have your horizontal canal, superior canal. Um, here's your oval window. Here's the round window. Um, here is your facial nerve right here. And then here, this is a patient that has um, a, a dehiscent facial nerve. So here's a, your um, horizontal canal. And the facial nerve is dehiscent. And there's a very significantly large scar band that goes from the tympanic membrane all the way to the facial nerve. So as you raise the, the tympanic membrane flap and you try to take that scar band down and that scar band is very thick, as you can see, you're going to pull on that thing. You're going to pull on the facial nerve and cause facial paralysis. You know, this is a patient that, that doesn't have, it's not a revision surgery. It's not a cholesteatoma. Um, you know, it was just a perforation. And so, you know, had we not had the CT scan, we could have put this facial nerve in danger potentially. Um, I, as I said, I use the facial nerve monitor on most of my cases, probably nearly all cases. Um, as I said, it can save you, but it doesn't replace the knowledge of anatomy, just like sinus surgery. In, in the middle ear, um, as long as you're lateral to the incus, you won't run into the facial nerve, but be aware of anterior to the um, the uh, incus or medial to the incus, that's where the facial nerve is going to be. So be very careful dissecting in that area. So in the middle ear, you're more likely to get an abrasion of the facial nerve rather than actually a cutting of the um, nerve if your monitor is working and it's, you know, uh, you're using it and stuff. In the mastoid, it's more likely to occur with a cutting burr um, because that's what take out, take out a chunk of the facial nerve. But it would be very difficult to actually cut a facial nerve with a diamond burr if it's like three millimeters or larger. So if you're looking for the facial nerve, you can use a larger diamond burr to, to find it because the facial nerve is about a 1.5 millimeter structure. And if you're using a bigger burr, you're, you know, if this is the facial nerve, you have a bigger burr on the side here, you're, less, you're just going to cause an abrasion. If you use a small burr, like a one millimeter, you're more likely to, to actually get into the nerve and actually cut it. A larger burr will kind of just side, on the side will kind of abrade it, but it's less likely to cut it unless you put pressure on it. So if you get an injury, you want to relax and keep your cool. The more nervous and anxious you get, the more you're going to think not logically and going to do things that are potentially going to further endanger other things. So step back and just assess, zoom out, put some cotton ball with epinephrine in there and just let the bleeding stop and then, then take everything off and take a look. Then get your facial nerve probe and stimulate at a high level um, proximal to the cochleariform process. So you go above the cochleariform process and you stimulate there with one or two milliamps and to check to see if the, the entire system is intact. If you get a stimulation of the nerve, then you're okay and you just need to do steroids. You just cover it with some gel foam with steroids and just don't, don't work in that area, at least at that point. Um, if you don't get stimulation, then you wanna decompress a little bit on either side of the potential injury and assess. Um, if there is a cut, then you need to get a graft from the greater auricular nerve. Um, if you're not experienced in treating it, of course, call in uh, for help and close and refer it to somebody who has experience uh, taking care of this problem. Tegman injury, um, it, again, occurs 
in, in contracted mastoids. So small mastoids uh, is where a lot of problems occur. Um, as I said, the low tegmin, small, te- small uh, mastoid is where most problems occur. Um, that's the horizontal, that's everything else pretty much. The, generally, the tegmin is your friend if you're lost, but um, you want to follow it in. And what the, sometimes the tendency is, is that people find it somewhere and they avoid it, and then, then they get lost, and then they try to take down all that bone, and then they, they run into the tegmin. If you're going to be drilling to look for the tegmin, you want to turn your microscope and looking directly at the tegmin. So if the tegmin is in this direction, and you're drilling in this direction, you can potentially put a hole in the side and not realize it. But if you're looking at it from, the, from an inferior to superior direction, you can see the thinness. And then, of course, you're listening to that high frequency sound of the tegmin that it makes when you're getting very thin on the bone. If you're getting a lot of little oozing from the tegmin, think that that might be it. But always drill around it. If you're not sure if it's a tegmin, drill around it. The, the tegmin is in a plane. An air cell is going to be a single pocket. So if you drill around it, the, the single pocket will stick up. But in a plane, like the tegmin, you're going to see the entire plane of the tegmin. Um, on the CT scan, look for a tegmin that's lower than your superior canal. So here's the superior canal. This is the tegmin. This is actually the before and after of this patient. Um, and you can see on this side, the patient um, had surgery. And this is the tegmin. And you can see they, they drilled this okay, uh, sort of in an inside-out fashion and no problems. On this side, though, when they drilled, they went through the tegmin. And then, you know, this is packing, actually. Uh, they placed it, then they sent the patient to us. And this is, you can see, the brain is, is hanging out in, in the mass site at this point. So if you um, get uh, an injury, you, if there's no bleeding, you just want to cover it up. Uh, I just put a piece of gel foam to kind of hold any potential bleeding and kind of control bleeding. I, I put bone wax so my drill doesn't catch the gel foam. Um, put a large kind of piece of bone wax to sort of cover it. And then we work and, and finish and then we'll address it. So you, you don't want to unnecessarily uh, enlarge the opening. Uh, you, as I said, remove the bone wax, you control bleeding with bipolar. Um, it's best to try to separate the dura. It's kind of just like a, 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 your, if you're doing a uh, sinus uh, surgery, a breach report, a breach repair. So you have a, a hole. And um, you, uh, this is, if this is the hole, you want to kind of separate. I'm going to show you a video of this. Separate the bone from the inside a little bit, from the dura, and then put your patch on, under, uh, between the bone and the dura. And then use some fibrin glue, some bone pate. And if it's a large defect, you have to use some fat and some compression to kind of hold the fat to prevent brain herniation. Um, if the defect is large, um, then you, you might need potentially help from somebody who does this, but you need something to hold pressure against to prevent the brain from herniating. Um, and this is, this is a patient um, who had had a previous mastoid surgery, I think about 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and then he came to us um, and uh, he, he came actually for a mastoid uh, debridement. And he had, this is all dura, uh, filled with CSF inside his mastoid cavity. Um, so he had a very large defect uh, of the, the middle fossa floor. And, and he was a, 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 a little obese. Uh, so it probably had a little higher intracranial pressure that it created much larger in, uh, opening there. So this is uh, um, a, um, a video that I'm going to show you. This is a patient who had previous surgery and had had a tegman defect. Here you can see the soft tissue is adherent to it. And this is, uh, as my resident is actually uh, putting the retractor in, he's essentially, unfortunately, separating the soft tissue and, and kind of causing a, a tear in the dura. So this is, we're looking through the dura. The dura has now been separated. Now he went ahead and separated this, um, but really what he separated, he, he separated the dura from, uh, from the defect. So the patient had had a previous surgery um, you know, but if someone has previous surgery, you need to see the CT scan. If there's a defect, you need to go very carefully in this area. 
So here I'm separating the bone from the, the dura. So there's remaining dura, of course, on the inside. So we're separating that. And here's our fascia graft. And then, then we're going to try to get this under the edges everywhere. And you want your fascia graft to be, the, the placement of the graft to be so good that you should get no leak with just the graft alone. If you have no leak with the graft alone, it's going to hold. If, you're, if you have to rely on fibrin glue to hold your CSF leak, it is not going to hold the CSF leak. So here it is. This is what it looks like. Now we put the fibrin glue to kind of just seal things up. Now, what I also do is I close off the attic. So in case that my primary um, repair does not hold, if there is a leak, that it doesn't have the chance to get into the middle ear. And then I, I put this titanium mesh over this to just create some compression over that area. Um, we put some muscle in there as well. And then I guess I, I haven't done it yet. So here's the muscle. This way, there is a barrier between our skin and soft tissue and the, um, the area of the defect. Um, or, you know, if this patient gets a failure of their perforation repair, we're not going to open the mastoid, really, because the mastoid's been cleaned out. There's, a, there's fascia separating the middle ear from the mastoid. So if there's mastoid disease, it's not going to affect the middle ear. So if, if there's a failure, which in this case there wasn't, we, you know, you could just repair the tympanic membrane and you don't have to even leave this area alone. And then I just press on that titanium mesh to create some compression so that that muscle is really plugging that hole from the outside. So you have an underlay and then you have an overlay uh, graft on top of it. Sigmoid sinus injury is most likely to occur uh, and of course, an anterior or lateral sigmoid like this, um, you know, if the distance between your sigmoid and the posterior ear canal wall is less than five millimeters, consider an inside-out mastoidectomy rather than doing an outside-in regular mastoidectomy. Or use a very small burr uh, for your surgery to, to preserve and, and thin your ear canal and stay away from your uh, sigmoid. In general, if its structure is important, we always are trying to avoid it. But the best thing to do is actually try to identify that structure and then preserve it and then work around it. So it's better sometimes to actually find the thing that you're most afraid of getting into and then control it and then work on it. Now, if you don't have as much experience and you're kind of, uh, you know, more novice or don't do the surgery as often, then, you know, you might want to do a different strategy. But in general, you want to identify the, the, the structure you're most afraid of and control it, and that's, you're much less likely to get into uh, problems. Now, as you're operating, you know, in a mastoid like this, you really can't get into the space anyway from between here. But in a mastoid like this, um, you want to be turning the, the patient away so you can follow the ear canal. So your direction of drilling is in that direction not in this direction, because you're more likely to potentially get into the sigmoid. Um, and some of these cases will require a canal wall down. And um, I can give another talk for your group about how I do canal wall downs, and, and we obliterate the mastoid. And so it really is, doesn't cause any issues uh, on its own. Sigmoid sinus injury, if it occurs, um, place large piece of gel foam. I actually have my... Um, uh, scrub uh, technician always have large pieces of gel foam uh, that I call postage stamp size, so like this big, that they put on the side. It's always ready just in the very, very un unlikely case of a sigmoid sinus injury. You hold pressure for a couple of minutes. You put something on it to kind of hold uh, the pressure. You gently remove the cottonoids or cotton and then leave the gel foam on. Put some bone wax so your drill doesn't catch the gel foam and continue on with the surgery. And at the end, you remove the bone wax and you put bone pate. It's venous bleeding. Pressure stops it. So this is a video of it. Um, 
So uh, let me just show you the CT scan here. So you can see on the CT scan, the sigmoid was uh, anterior and lateral. Um, and so this is one of my residents that I joke always is that, thank goodness he's doing sinus surgery now. But um, you can see that the, here's the sigmoid. It's already thin and he missed it. And then, um, of course, he hit it. Of course, putting the suction on it isn't going to help. So you got to put your finger on it. This is me putting my finger on it now. Um, and so I put gel foam and we put some cotton. We just held it for a couple of minutes. Now, once I knew it was stopped, I took the cotton ball off. I put the bone wax on. And this is to just prevent our drill from catching anything so that it doesn't restart the drilling or restart the bleeding. And so we're just taking the extra bone wax off so that we can continue with the surgery. And we just use the smaller burr, this is a three millimeter burr now, um, to thin the ear canal. You can see how thick the ear canal was that he'd left the, uh, the ear canal. Now in the middle ear, um, you can, uh, the structures that are at risk are as follows. And jugular bulb injury is most likely to occur um, in the middle ear, although it can occur if it's high in the mastoid, where I've seen a case where somebody drilled through the facial nerve and the jugular bulb at the same time and inferior in the mastoid. So that's why when you're inferior in a mastoid, you stay posteriorly. That way you stay away from the facial nerve and the jugular bulb. But this was uh, a novice uh, surgeon, unfortunately. Um, so we talked about this. The jugular bulb is very fragile. So if you have a jugular bulb that is dehiscent in the middle ear, you can't try to separate the jugular bulb from the bony wall because it is very thin and it's very adherent and you're going to tear it. So just leave it alone. If you see it in the middle ear, just leave it alone. Don't try to um, do anything with it other than maybe put some gel foam to kind of protect you from accidentally instrumenting it or putting some own wax or something. Um, if a tear occurs, you treat it the same way as a sigmoid sinus injury. You just put gel foam and hold pressure and that's it. Um, in venous injury, you don't want to raise the patient's head. Um, there's a tendency to think, okay, well, let's raise the head, less pressure. But what you're actually doing is you're more likely to have actually an air embolus occur. So if you have a venous injury, the head stays down. If anything, you want to put the patient with their head further down so you don't get it. A, um, an air embolus, because an air embolus will kill the patient, whereas just some bleeding from the sigmoid is not going to kill the patient, because you can control it. All right, um, so of course, having a CT scan, and I actually put the CT scan up in the operating room, so even though now everything is, is digital uh, on our scans, I will have them print the scan, and I put it up in the operating room, so just as I'm entering the middle ear, or if my resident's entering the middle ear, I look at the scan and I look to see where the jugular bulb is. If you have a very high jugular bulb like this, then you're going to potentially get into it. And so you have to be very careful and, and just stay away from it. And so you enter the middle ear a little bit further uh, up superiorly, so, or you enter it at sort of a mid-posterior um, area. In general, only dissect inferiorly in the middle ear with blunt instrumentation. So you don't want to stick a rosin needle down in the, if you don't have a scan, don't stick a rosin needle down inferior in the middle ear. You don't want to stick a rosin needle down into the eustachian tube area as well, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Corda tympani nerve <clears throat> is something you should talk to the patient about. It's always good to know what the patient does for a living. If the patient's job involves their taste, you really want to have a good conversation about the Corda timpani with them. Uh, so if they're a chef or they're a um, wine uh, taster or something like that, you have to be very careful to make sure that you, you, they, they know that there is a potential risk to that nerve. Now, the areas where we're going to get in trouble with corda timpani nerve are most commonly in an atelectatic middle ear. So this is a patient who had an atelectasis. And when we have atelectasis, a lot of the bone around the corda can be destroyed. And you can see this corda, this is a left ear, the corda comes off very low in the ear canal. And if you're not careful, you're kind of just dissecting towards the tympanic membrane, you're gonna potentially get into this. So as you get close, 
um, to the tympanic membrane. And we obviously separated the tympanic membrane already in this patient. But you have to be always zoom up so you have a much better uh, view. The corda usually has these little blood vessels on it that run in a kind of a longitudinal fashion, as opposed to the fibrous annulus, where the blood vessels tend to run in, a, in an opposite direction. Sometimes you can have a fold of mucosa. So if you can't figure out where the corda is, look for the malleus and look under the malleus up high. That's where the corda is going to be. It's always going to be between your malleus and incus. If it's cut, you just leave it alone. Um, the chance of taste disturbance is not very high. So only in general, about 40% of people will have a change in their taste. Um, if you can get the two edges together and put some, uh, on, as you put your fascograph and put the edges together, there was a paper out of Japan that, that showed that there was some benefit to that. Now, a secular chain injury most likely occurs when you're dissecting, again, clustitoma or granulation tissue or scar around the incus and thapes. The incus is most susceptible to a lateral to medial force. So if you have your incus long process, if you put a hook under it and pull, that's how you can dislocate it. Stapes is most susceptible to a superior to inferior or inferior to superior instrumentation where you can fracture the, the stapes. And the malleus is most susceptible to a um, medial lateral force or up high, a lateral to medial. So if you're uh, the handle of the malleus, if you pull on it, you can dislocate it. Um, the upper part, if the lateral process of the malleus, or the malleus head, if you press that, you can also dislocate it. So we have to be careful curetting things close to the malleus head because, or exostoses that are close to the sympathetic membrane. Those are areas where you don't want to use a curette because the back of the curette can lean on the malleus and dislocate it. So in general, um, if you're, these injuries tend to occur where you don't, where you have not identified your structures. And that's when you have granulation tissue or a lot of scar. So if you're lost, the best way to do it is figure out where is the promontory? You started the promontory, find that, that's going to be the easiest thing to find. And then you march up until it sort of starts falling medially. So you get that, that curvature going, going medially as you go superiorly. That then tells you where the oval window is. From there, two millimeters inferiorly is going to be your round window. And then the facial nerve is right about that. And then the corda, um, I'm, there are some surgeons who really like cutting cordas, but try to preserve the corda for the patient's sake. But it also helps you identify where the malleus and incus are. Sometimes you have a very retracted malleus that looks like the incus. But then when you see that the corda is going under it, then you know that that's the malleus. Um, the stapes capitulum always assume it's there. It's generally resistant to disease. And so you have to always assume the stapes is there. If you have a pars flaccid acclesitoma, most likely your stapes is going to be intact. So just assume that the stapes is going to be there. It's a posterior superior quadrant cholesteatoma is where the stapes could be destroyed. But even in those where you think that the, there's no way the stapes would survive with all this cholesteatoma, you'll see that the cholesteatoma is draped around it and the stapes is still intact. So if the stapes is fractured, you want to assess your oval window integrity. That's the most important thing right away. If you can't tell, you just put fascia there. I, I soak the fascia in... Uh, steroids, uh, if, if, I'm, if there's any question of, of something that potentially may be a, a, a breach. So I'll put the steroid-soaked fascia uh, around the area. I, we give them steroids. I generally put round window steroids in every patient that I do surgery because that protects from noise-induced hearing loss. And you want to give them some IV antibiotics if there is an infection in the middle ear. Um, you want to finish the procedure and close and assess the hearing post-op. You want to continue your steroids and antibiotics and then send the more experienced colleague if, um, if it needs surgery. So if the patient's not deaf, six weeks later, they can go and have an ocicular reconstruction. Um, the ocicular injuries, if malleus or is dislocated, you just replace it and support it with gel foam. Fracture, we talked about if it's, uh, then you just have to correct it later. If it's incus is dislocated, you can replace it and put with um, mimics, which is hydroxyapatite. If hearing is poor, just consider it an interposition or port. Carotid artery injury is rare. 
generally it's going to be when you have a very uh, uh, lateral sitting carotid that's dehiscent. Um, you want to look at your CT before surgery so you know where it is. Carotid artery is going to look white in the middle ear. It's not going to look red. Uh, just like in the neck, it's white. Um, it doesn't pulsate because it's, it's surrounded by bone. Um, you don't want to sharply dissect in the eustachian tube. So in the anterior superior middle ear, use blunt instrumentation only. Carotid bleeding is something that's going to splash you in the face. It's not like a little bit of red blood is not the carotid artery. Um, if you have an injury, you put pressure with anything you can hold pressure with, and you take the patient to angiography and hope that they have an intact circle willis and they can plug it. So in general, know your anatomy, get a good CT scan from radiology. And a good CT scan is 0.6 millimeter cuts in a window settings of 4,900. So 4,000 for the W, 900 for the L. And um, review the scan, have it up in the operating room so you can reference it quickly. Ideally, if you have available to you, use a patient or monitor on every case. If you can't, then, then at least for revisions, uh, for areas where you're going to work around the nerve, cholesteatoma definitely do use it in those cases. Dissect meticulously. Um, keep your cool if something happens, but always be prepared for these injuries and know what you have to do. Uh, and of course, always know your limit as a surgeon so then you know when something should be sent to somebody before the surgery starts. But if you have a problem in, in surgery, call somebody in to help you. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you very much, I mean, very, very nice talk. Um, man, you guys get a lot of complications. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> in California, they get, they get referred, I guess you get referred to all these cases, huh? Yeah, you know, in, um, uh, you know, in the United States, uh, the training for ear surgery is uh, because there isn't as much chronic ears in, in the United States as, as there are in some, some other countries. And so the training is not as superb as it should be in residency. Um, and so really, if, if you don't do a fellowship, um, you know, it, you probably can't do anything more than the routine cases. Uh, but unfortunately, there's some people who, who feel very confident and want to do big cases even with just residency training. And that's, that's unfortunately when we see a lot of complications. Hmm. That, can you look at the chat uh, lines? There's just one question, I think. I just oh, yeah. Okay, let's see here. All right. Uh, you mentioned that you use round window steroids in every surgery. So you just put gel foam soaked in it or you inject it. No, I, um, I put gel foam soaked in, in uh, dexamethasone um, in the round window. Just as soon as I enter the middle ear, whether it's stapy surgery or tympanoplasty or anything, I'll put uh, gel foam soaked in uh, dexamethasone 10 milligram per uh, milliliter there. And it stays for the duration of the surgery and at the end I take it out. The, um, in a cochlear implant, I will inject uh, the steroid uh, before the surgery. So when I'm doing the, the injection of the lidocaine behind the ear, I will inject the steroid into the middle ear. That way the steroid actually sits there. That's for hearing preservation purposes. Um, delayed facial paralysis after surgery. Very good question. How to deal with it? Leave it alone. Just give them steroids and antivirals. And delayed facial paralysis after surgery is almost always a herpes simplex virus reactivation. It is not from your surgery. So you just leave it be and that will recover. I've had maybe three of these in the last you know, couple thousand cases um, that delayed paralysis and they all have recovered back to normal. And I should say none of them went to complete grade six. Um, I saw a case where somebody had done surgery. It was a younger surgeon did a surgery. Uh, the patient had a delayed facial paralysis uh, the surgeon then panicked and went and did surgery urgently um, to to try to fix the problem. And then they ended up like displacing everything and got, got more problems from, from the actual second surgery than they did from this first surgery. And, you know, as I said, delayed paralysis, this is just, just basic knowledge and, you know, 
that's why you have, you know, I tell my residents, you got to read all the time and keep up with the literature because if you don't, you, you do things like this and you get the patient in, in more trouble. Um, for larger defects in tegment, do you use cartilage? Yes, I do use cartilage, that's, that's a good question. So if the defect is, is more than a centimeter, I definitely use a cartilage, but it, it's very rare that, you know, we would see a, a defect that large. Um, but yes, if, if, if that is the case, we would, we would do it. I've maybe used it one time, but you have to be very careful getting cartilage. I've, I did a uh, revision once on a patient who they'd used cartilage to repair it, but when they took the cartilage from the concha, they, they'd left some of the cerumen glands on the cartilage. So then, then the mastoid was filled with cerumen and then you had a cartilage and then you had brain, you know, right above it. So it was just a complete mess. So when you're dissecting the cartilage on the back side, the cartilage you can be you can leave the the soft tissues on it, but on the front part of the cartilage where where you have ceruminous glands, you got to be right on perichondrium, uh, so you don't take any cerumen with you, a uh, cerumen gland. Is there a study of angle of tegmen anteriorly towards the root of zygoma? Is there a study of the angle of tegmen anteriorly? Um, I guess I'm not sure what the, what you mean by that, but um, I mean, obviously the angles are going to be different and that's why you really should be looking at your coronal uh, scan to look at the angle of the uh, your tegmen and how usually the tegmen comes down. And then as it goes medially, it goes up because that's where the ossicles are going to be. So sometimes when you're drilling, you drill, you identify the tegmen and then you have to get under the tegmen to look up to where the horizontal canal is. Taste problems with corda tympani injury, how do you manage? I usually just um, give it time. It, unfortunately, there isn't much you can do once the injury has occurred um, because a lot of times with time, it settles down um, because there's maybe takeover of the other side or the patient gets used to it. There's some patients who do get permanent problems. There was a, an anesthesiologist at our hospital who'd had surgery to pedophosity before and had had a corda tympani nerve injury and every time I was doing ear surgery, he would walk in and say, don't injure the corda. I can't taste, you know, my entire life because somebody injured my corda. So, uh, you know, it's, people do suffer. I mean, sometimes we just don't ask them about it. But if whole of the stapes came out, what to do? You cover it with fascia very quickly. Um, and hopefully if you're done with your dissection, then you just close up. Um, but if you're not done with your dissection, you want to put a big piece of fascia there and um, put maybe some uh, tis, tis, uh, your uh, fibrin glue or something to really hold it in place and then finish your dissection and then just leave it alone. Later, you can come in and put a prosthesis or something on there. Um, thank you for the comment. Post-surgery hearing loss, late identified. What is the worst prognosis and what robust management or intervention? So I guess I'm not sure if you mean, um, so if there is after surgery, you have hearing loss, they're deaf. If they're deaf, you know, then the first thing I would do is get a CT scan uh, to see if they have a perilymphistula potentially from maybe a round window or oval window leak. If that is the case, then you, you take some blood um, from their arm and inject the blood into the middle ear. Uh, we wrote a paper on this a few years ago. Uh, we call this the intratympanic blood patch and um, mostly for post uh, or perilymphistula, you inject the blood in the middle ear, let them sit for 30 minutes in the office, you give them a suction so they don't swallow, and then that usually plugs the leak and, and brings the hearing up. If it's a high frequency hearing loss, uh, then I would just use uh, intratympanic steroids and oral steroids. Um, after sigmoid sinus gel form repair, did you observe any jugular bulb vein thrombosis? No, generally, unless you compress your um, sigmoid sinus, um, you're not going to get a clot in it because the flow of blood is actually pretty robust. But if you really press on it or you use a bipolar a lot, yes. Uh, the only time we've seen a, a clot was like an acoustic neuroma case where we had a very high jugular bulb and we had to compress the jugular bulb down and we got uh, temporarily a clot in it. But other than that, I've never seen a clot occur from one of these cases. Um, and thank you for the other comments. Thank you very much, Harith. This is uh, the start of our weekend here.
Uh, All right, I, great. You still have one more day to work, huh? <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, tomorrow. So today and tomorrow is so a two days, technically. <laughs> uh, thank you again. I really enjoyed having you here to, your, to talk. It's always been very informative. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation, and thanks for everyone to, for coming and watching. And thank you all, and uh, we'll see you on Saturday. We're going to have the uh, International Working Group uh, board basically giving talks about the goods and the bad and in, in the scaric ear surgery so thank you and have a nice weekend take care thanks bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.